beautiful Sunday, this uh, fantastic day to come and to worship God together, amen? It's great to see smiling faces, looking back at us, it's always such an encouragement, so thank you very much. A reminder that after the service, today is the church uh, family potluck, after the worship time today, today is Communion Sunday. We'll be enjoying that together as well in fellowship. And what we're going to do right now is we're going to get into some singing, praising it to God with our voices. How's that sound? Sound like a good idea? Yeah. Last night, Lisa and I had the opportunity to do that for about an hour and a half with some folks over in Garland last night at uh, Mr. Scott Miller's uh, church. Many pastors over there in Garland and uh, a wonderful time. And uh, we're just so thankful that we get to do that again this morning with you all. So let's stand as we praise God together. Great is His faithfulness to us each and every day. Great is your faithfulness, O God of Jacob.
each other in today. Welcome, welcome, welcome.
truly continue to exalt you and lift you up and not be content even with what we're doing here for worship, but that we want to go farther, that we want to go deeper, that we want to have a, a, even a more genuine, more sincere connection and relationship with you, Lord, deeper, deeper still. Lord, I pray that, that we cut through uh, what the world often uh, paints as what, uh, what we are as Christians and, and, and leave that behind and truly look at your word and who we are in Christ. Look at all that we have before us, for us, and, and for us in the future by your word and your word alone. May we trust. May we trust in you, Lord, as we you already have provided so magnificently, so wondrously. Lord, I thank you for your blessings. As we take the tithe and offering, help us to understand that what, what we're doing is, is, is worship. Help us to understand, Lord, that what we do serves to please you and no one else. Lord, we don't do this singing to, to please men's ears. We don't give our tithe and offering to please the, the church trustees. We don't, uh, we don't go out and, and preach or live your word to... Uh, to someone else's, else's delight. We do it for your glory, Lord. We do it for your glory. Help us to worship you. Help us to honor those around us. Help us to worship you and glorify you. And only you, Lord, the one true God. Lord, how deep your love truly is for us. How vast it is beyond measure. In Jesus' name we pray.
You know, you're my sister. I always wanted a redheaded sister. I don't know why. But, you know. How is that possible? Your last name's Robbins. Your last name's Knight. I'm Reese. How is that possible? Only through Jesus. We don't know what we're going to be like, John says, but we know that one day when we see him, we shall see him face to face, and we shall be like him. That's awesome. Because who doesn't want to be like Jesus? If you belong to him, you want to be like him. Right? We are part of the family of God. Now, if you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior this morning, then I would encourage you when the prayer comes by, just politely, Hand it to the person next to you. Nobody's going to judge you. That's between you and God. In fact, the Bible says you stand condemned already. We have nothing to do with that. And you would be eating and drinking judgment down upon yourself if you took of this without knowing Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior. Now, there may be somebody in here that says, you know, I know Jesus as my Savior, but man, I wanted to kill somebody or hurt them very badly. Or in the words of AT&T, reach out and touch them. And you know you're not in right relationship with them. Which means you're not in right relationship with God. Can I just offer you this escape clause? <coughs> the escape clause is simply this. Don't make it right. You need to use the telephone, go to the job. If you need to talk to someone here, go grab and say, let's go talk. You can use my office, my study. You can use the library here. You can go back to the foyer. Go on the front porch if it's not raining. But folks, it's so important that we keep a short account with God and with each other. And if you're saying, well, I can't deal with this till Tuesday, okay, call me up and say, I dealt with it. We're in right relationship again. And you could even say, can we, can we have communion together, just you and your wife and us? You know what my answer's going to be, don't you? Yeah. I love those times. Because when people are getting right with God, that's exciting. So this morning, the elders are going to be serving you. As they serve the bread, just take a piece of bread, hold on to it, pass it to the person next to you. After all of us have been served, we're going to partake together, okay? We'll get to eat it together. Then the cup will be served to you. And as the cup is served to you, you just take one of the cups, drink it, put it back, and then you serve to the person next to you. Understand this, you're serving your brother or sister. And if they say, no, thank you. They could simply take the tray and pass it to the person next to them. Okay, again, no judgment. That's not our responsibility here. Okay? Yeah. Renee, would you lead us in prayer, please? Father God, you saved me. You saved anyone who would turn to you and ask you for forgiveness. Because of your Son, our Savior, our King, Jesus, who is in us. Total obedience to you went to the cross and gave, gave the way for our salvation. Father God, thank you for loving us so much that you would make that sacrifice for me and all my brothers and sisters here in this sanctuary and all around the world. Father God, pray for the blessing of this bread and this juice so that we would just reverence the sacrifice that has been made for us so that we can be right with you forever.
stand as we sing together. He is able. This is this old worship song from 1989. So. He is able.
saying that because she knows what Zeppelin has. All right. Now that we've got the housekeeping business out of the way, God revealing himself. We're going to be in Luke chapter 1, verses 56 through 66. You think about reading through the Bible. Every time you read through the Bible, read a portion of the Bible, do you understand that that is God revealing more of himself to us? We know that the word is often called the mind of God. You want to know the mind of God? Read the Bible. You want to know who God is? How do you know? Well, you can see a little bit in creation around you, but you really don't know who God is further until you read through the scriptures. The Bible reveals to us who God is, what God has done, and what he will do. It's revealing more of God. And you know, we're, we're very blessed to have access to the scriptures and to all this information because God chose to make it available to us through the prophets, through angels, through the apostles, and others. And you know, it, it's no different for us today than it was centuries back. As we look at this passage in Luke, we'll be looking at the birth in the first few days of John the Baptist's life. And as you think back in your mind about this, we can remember <clears throat> excuse me, God's revelation of himself in so many ways already, and we're not even out of chapter 1. Okay? We, we remember that God sent his messenger angel Gabriel to Zacharias there in the temple to promise that Elizabeth was going to have a son even in her old age. And of course, Zacharias, the soon-to-be future dad, heard that announcement. God revealed himself again by removing the ability for Zacharias to speak. And some would suggest even to hear. And when they got back home, God revealed even more of himself as the giver of life as he called, caused Elizabeth to become pregnant. And today we will see God revealing his power and faithfulness and integrity as he restores Zechariah's speaking abilities. Now before we look at these verses a bit more in detail, it would be good for us to remember that Luke was a doctor and an historian. Okay? So as a doctor, you know, we, we look at this and we know that one purpose of Luke writing this narrative here is to explain more fully to Theophilus who God was. To reveal to Theophilus who God is. So as a physician, Luke understood the absolute impossibility of Elizabeth becoming pregnant unless... God revealed himself in some incredible manner. Now, as a historian, he also understood, again, looking back, he could understand this clearly, as he's writing this down, that the birth of John the Baptist was about to usher in the Messiah, who was going to come and provide salvation to all who would believe upon his name. Isn't that marvelous? <coughs> God's revealing of himself more and more. Now, the other Gospels give a bit more information into this special occasion. And by special occasion, I'm speaking specifically of the birth of this child, John the Baptist. Now, any birth ought to be a special occasion, right? Now, even though we've had multiple children, like I really gave birth to any of them, but, you know, we, we, we see this, and as we find out we're pregnant again, yeah, I said it like that, didn't I? We're pregnant again with a question mark, exclamation mark, question mark following it. I can get that backwards, but anyway. And it takes a while for God to reveal to us the incredible joy and celebration that is ours because he's chosen to bless us with another child. That happens when you adopt a child. The difference is you usually don't have a nine-month waiting period. It's either immediate or it's several years. But God reveals himself in this way again. We're going to glean some 
more insight here about God because how do we get to know more about God today besides the Word of God? And how is it we know that He truly cares? Because if you're like the average person walking around this planet as a believer in Jesus Christ, you probably have those moments that you say, yes, I believe God is real. I believe God's not dead. But right now, I'm not sure where He is in my life. How can I know that He really cares for me? <clears throat> and it appears to me that in the Bible and in our lives today, in 2016, God is continually revealing Himself. The problem for many is that there's a tendency to look in the wrong places for God or listen to the wrong voices about God. So on this next slide, this is where I want us to be looking at himself, looking at ourselves here, as we continue to keep our eyes on Jesus. Do you see it's a pattern here? Always looking to Jesus. As we continue to keep our eyes on Jesus, we will see more and more of God's activity in our daily lives. One missionary made the comment that the problem with us in North America, we say we don't see God working, is because we're not pursuing Jesus. If you don't pursue Jesus, you don't know what God looks like in his activities day by day. Well, first of all, we're going to look at verses 56 through 58, and we're going to see that God's promises are true. He reveals that his promises are true. Follow along, if you will. And Mary stayed with her, meaning Elizabeth, about three months, and then returned to her home. Now the time had come for Elizabeth to give birth, and she gave birth to a son. Her neighbors and her relatives heard that the Lord had displayed his great mercy toward her. Don't you just love that? They didn't just hear she was having a baby. They heard that the Lord had displayed his great mercy toward her, and... They were rejoicing with her. So three months have passed since two weeks ago. You follow that one? Okay. Three months have passed. Elizabeth's about to give birth. Mary's back home with her family. She's back home with her family because she's not yet officially married. So now Luke's focus is on the birth of Jesus, or the birth of John the Baptist, which is the beginning of a multitude of miracles until the time of the birth of Jesus. And then... What fun begins. What we're seeing here is that God's promises all the way back to the Old Testament, to the very beginning, always are true. When God had Gabriel give the promise to Zacharias that he and Elizabeth were going to have a son, and that they would call him John, and that he would be the forerunner for the Messiah, even though Zacharias couldn't talk, I am guessing that in his mind, especially as a priest, as a godly priest, he had the scriptures just floating in his mind and just permeating his every being. And what we know as Joshua 21, uh, verse 45, he knew simply as this, not one of the good promises which the Lord had made to the house of Israel failed. All came to pass. Do you find yourself sometimes going back in your memory banks? Something happens that's just absolutely amazing. You know it's of God. And this verse just kind of just, remember? It just pops up there like a little flashing neon sign. And you're, oh, ah, that's what God meant. You see, throughout the Bible, when God makes a promise, we're guaranteed it will happen. Here, Luke, in a very professional manner, states... The time had come for Elizabeth to give birth. Doesn't that sound like a doctor? <laughs> it's time. <clears throat> You're going to have a baby now. And this exciting event that's about to happen is going to change the world forever. Because after John was born, Jesus is born a few months later. Now, think about all those judgmental people that had been looking down on Elizabeth because she was barren all those years. They weren't able to do so any longer. Elizabeth was rejoicing along with her neighbors because of God's great mercy to her. 
God had promised, he kept his promises. They were true. Now why was there all this rejoicing? Was it because there was some medical intervention or fluke accident or incident that caused her to be pregnant? Well, very simply, the Lord had displayed his great mercy towards her, or toward her. So often we rejoice and have great applause and high fives and all that when something tangible happens to us. But how often do we have those high fives, the applause, the cheers, because of God's great mercy for us? Because God has kept His promises in our life. Yesterday we were at uh, Maria's graduation with her master's degree along with all of Gordon's bachelor students, his bachelor of science and arts and music students there. And uh, it was just hilarious. Families from all over North America, some from India, some from Haiti, uh, and there were rows, and, and so we decided we're going to join in the fun. Okay? So when it's time for the name to be read off, these families would jump up and shout and pump their arms, and one dad said, it's about time. You know, going, oh, man, that poor child, what they can't hear. Uh, they couldn't, as we found out later on, Maria couldn't hear us when we were saying, yay, go Maria. And I'm thinking, wouldn't that be awesome? If as we're singing a song sometime, or as the scripture verse is read, we go, yeah, that's the God I'm talking about. That might be a little wild, wouldn't it? Shouldn't we? What, what's holding us back? God's promises are true. We've seen it in our lives. It's not just that we've read about somebody else's life. It's not just that we saw it on a program or read it on Facebook. It's because we personally experience that God keeps His promises. God's mercy has seen countless times through the ages in the lives of each one of us yeah. as well. And folks, there are some of you who are going through a difficult time and are experiencing suffering of your own right now, but I can promise you that God will enable you to have the opportunity to experience joy as you experience His mercy. And when He chooses to remove that suffering or help to clarify that suffering. Well, let's go on and see that God's purposes are tender in verses 59 through 63. And it happened that on the eighth day they came to circumcise the child. And they were going to call him Zacharias after his father. But his mother answered and said, No, indeed, but he shall be called John. And they said to her, There's no one among your relatives who's called by that name. And they made signs to his father as to what he wanted him called. And he asked for a tablet and wrote as follows, His name is John. And they were all astonished. Now, you have to think, how many of you remember Rhoda Morgenstern? Uh, she, she was a character on Mary Tyler Moore and a friend of Yeah, very Jewish. And, and uh, in the, the comedy that comes out, of, and a lot of the Jewish people who are actors and comedians call it upon themselves. So I don't think I'm being out of line here at all. In fact, I've got some good Jewish Christian friends who identify a lot with this. It's kind of like some family units uh, that get together and you just see it. You, you just, you, you know what it's like to be surprised by something that you didn't expect or you know you didn't deserve it. Uh, it's like, whoa! What happened here? How did this take place? That's the tenderness, the mercy of our God as he gives us that which we don't deserve. That's grace personified. Every person deserves punishment and hell. But in God's tenderness, he extends grace to those who follow him. Think about that tenderness and grace which you and I have experienced. 
the Bible, just looking at the word tenderness and the word grace, looking for different adjectives, it was amazing. Well, let me just give you a few of them. Great. <laughs> Surpassing. Sovereign. Rich. Manifold. That's a, that's a powerful word. All sufficient. That takes you to the hymn, doesn't it? Abundant. Glorious. That all has to do with God's tenderness and His grace. And here in this section, we see God's tenderness and grace shine forth because of a problem with the naming of a child. Now, it, it just, it's kind of silly, but you read it, it, it's just amazing. In Jewish tradition, the male child was circumcised on the eighth day after birth. Okay? There's something to look forward to. Uh, now, there are various reasons why it was done. Various reasons why it's done. But I believe that Genesis 17 gives us probably the main reason in that this was the sign of the Abrahamic covenant. It showed that you belong to the Jewish people. You're part of God's chosen people. In addition, as you read the New and the Old Testament, this act serves as an illustration of our need for cleansing from sin. Okay? So it was almost, I hate to say it, but it, it was like an outward, visible sign that you were part of the Jewish people. So, as you think about that, here they, there's a whole bunch of people here, because it, also in Jewish tradition, when circumcision was performed, it was an event. There were at least ten people or more that come to the house and they had the circumcision ritual. Oftentimes a rabbi was there, not necessarily. So you've got this group of, think, think the Jewish comedy family now, okay? You've got this group of ten people or more that are present here to verify, yes, it was done. Yes, this person is part of our community. They're part of God's chosen people. And they also played a part in naming the child. So probably there's a lot of relatives here. Now, we all have relatives that know better than us what needs to be done. Right? Uh, if you don't believe it, have a child. You have relatives that will tell you how you're not doing it right or how you need to do it differently. <laughs> now, and, and I say that and she leaves. <laughs> no, it's okay. Uh, so as you look at this, they're saying, hey, Zacharias. That's a good, that's, that's the daddy's name. It's very common to name the son, the oldest son in particular. This will be their only son, more than likely after the dad or the grandpa. Bless Elizabeth's heart. She was the Jewish Willis. What you talking about? No, indeed. You could just hear this elderly Jewish now mama saying, uh-uh, this isn't going to happen. His name's John. Now all the family, nice Jewish family, <coughs> oh, but there's Who's on your side of the family that's, nobody's on his side, nobody's on your side, because tradition is you don't name a name outside of your family. Come on, Zacharias is good. Remember the old Sunday school song, I will not be, I will not be moved? Elizabeth was singing it. So, good family members, as we have experienced, if they can't get you to persuade, change your mind, they're going to do an end run around you and find someone else that will agree with them. Zacharias. What do you think? It says they were making signs. Now, I didn't do sign language. I don't know sign language. I'm just fluttering around as if I knew what I'm talking about. Okay? They were doing sign language. Which is interesting because we know that he was mute. But it seems like he was also deaf. And as you look up the word, the word can mean muteness or deafness. Otherwise, why would they have been making signs to him? What, what do you want to call him? And so Zacharias gets this tablet, probably had wax on top of it. Remember those old tablets we used to give our children? You have a little stencil and you write on it, they peel it off, and 
the beginning was brand new. They do it in church. You know, and, it's, and then they can start breaking new words again and peel them back. Well, it's kind of a similar principle. They have wax over it, and you can rub it to get the old words off of there. And so this is brought to him, and he very stoically writes, this name is John. That was backwards, so it's probably Hebrew to you. Anyway, so his name is John. His name is John. Oh, and they were all astonished. These guys, having a child in their old age, must have really fried their brains. Well, you know, you and I know why it was John. Elizabeth and Zacharias probably knew also why it was John. You know the answer? Every parent says, because I said so. Here they could say, because God said so. And you don't argue with God. That's his name. Has been since before she was pregnant. I love what R.C. Sproul says. So when Gabriel announced to Elizabeth and Zechariah that they were going to have a baby, and what the name of that baby was to be, he was giving them a message they understood. He was saying, your baby belongs to God. His name will be given by God himself. God has decreed his name shall be John. Are names important? Absolutely. Do you know that the name for John means God is gracious? You knew that, didn't you? Yes. Isn't that awesome? I can't think of a more perfect name. After all, John is going to be the forerunner to the Messiah who would proclaim God's tender purposes in providing salvation by grace through faith to all who would believe. Well, the reality is they were astonished. <laughs> Do you think they were astonished then? They haven't seen astonishment yet. You know, first of all, you've got this miraculous birth. That's amazing. God revealing himself. Somebody spit on my iPad. Anyway. <laughs> you've got the mother and father both agreeing on the same name. And they agree on a name that didn't fit in with the tradition. Well, let's go on to the next verses and see what's going to happen. We see in verses 6 through 4 through 66 that God's power is tremendous. And at once his mouth was open and his tongue loosed. And he began to speak in praise of God. Fear came on all those living around them, and all these matters were being talked about in the hill country of Judea. By the way, that's what it sounded like when the parents were trying to convince everybody the name was John. The baby wasn't quite like the baby was probably making noises. Well, circumcision's about to happen. You know the baby makes noise then. Okay? All who heard them kept things in mind, kept them in mind saying, What then will this child turn out to be? For the hand of the Lord was certainly with him. So immediately after Zacharias proclaimed that their son's name would be John, the Bible says his mouth was open and his tongue loosed, and he began to speak praise to God. Folks, you have got to love God's power being released like that. And I find it absolutely wonderful that the first words out of Zacharias' mouth was not, well, it's about time. <laughs> or can you imagine how all the arguments I wanted to get into, I couldn't? What's his first words? Praise to God. Praise to God. Not, not even, what was that all about? Can you blame me for having a trust issue? No, not at all. It's just praise to God. And he had nine plus months to think about it. God was on display for everyone to see. And folks, throughout Scripture, when God does a miracle, there are several things that are always true if it's of God. It's immediate, it's instantaneous, and it's permanent. 
If God's doing it, it's immediate, it's instantaneous, and it's permanent. Gabriel had promised this was going to happen. After the baby's born, you're going to talk again, okay? No anger, no animosity. Yet notice in the very next sentence, fear came on all those living around them. That just doesn't seem right, does it? Because there probably were discussions going on in every household saying, hey, you think God's coming? God must be coming. I haven't seen stuff like this in forever. People knew there was something amazing and miraculous, not that had just taken place, but that was about to take place. Because they asked the question, what then will this child turn out to be? Think about all the tongue wagging. And you could put the Jewish accent in if you want. You know, first of all, in the very beginning, get a load of Elizabeth. She's pregnant. What's going on with that? Or Zacharias can't even speak his own mind. What? What's the deal with him being quiet?
There's also a couple of life lessons that I believe we can glean from this today. We talked about the Jewish meeting, the circumcision celebration. Zacharias had already been disciplined for his lack of faith. But do you notice that it's been put, being put again to the test by this group that was there? I believe there are times in our lives when God has given us a life le lesson. And we believe, <coughs> lesson learned, let's move on. Let's move on from here. And we run into people that seem to think that they know what's best for us. And they try to get us to compromise or to change or to not be so fanatical. Not be so radical. Not be such a Jesus freak. And that's a test to see if our faith in God is what it ought to be. But just like Zacharias, he wasn't interested in keeping peace in the family. I like that. Not that we want to create strife in the family, but he wasn't, he wasn't, he could care less. Elizabeth could care less as to whether there was peace in their immediate family. It was all about obedience to God. That's where we need to be. That willingness to surrender and to submit ourselves to God, not to people, not to tradition, not to what everyone else chooses to do. Because when we do that, we're able to experience the joy that comes from humble obedience to God. And finally, let me take you to that last sentence in verse 66. The hand of the Lord was certainly with him. I thought about that and thought about it and I thought, wouldn't it be awesome if the world would just sit up and take notice if reporters came to interview every one of us and all they could walk away with was the hand of the Lord was certainly with them. No other scuttlebutt, just this is obvious. Wouldn't it be marvelous if your neighbors could say this of you? And then I thought a little bit more, I'm not trying to be morbid or anything, but I thought, wouldn't this be a great eulogy? Or wouldn't it be great to see this on a caption on a tombstone? The hand of the Lord was certainly with him. But that's what people would know you and me as people whose hand of God was on us. And if I allow that to happen in my life, not only will more of God be revealed to me, but God will reveal himself through me and to all those around me. What an amazing way for us to proclaim Jesus, right? You know, I've, I've talked about writing a book, and I'm thinking every one of us ought to write a book entitled, the hand of the Lord was certainly with you. And then just start listing off every incident where you saw the hand of God in your life. Taking control when you wanted to, but you knew it would just reveal you and not Jesus. Let's stand as we close in prayer. <coughs> Heavenly Father, we are thankful for our obedience such as Zacharias and Elizabeth. And not even fully grasping what was ahead, they knew that you were in charge. They knew that your promises would be kept. They knew that you would show your mercy and your grace and your tenderness. And they knew that you would reveal yourself in power. Lord, thank you. Even for how Zacharias responded as soon as he had the chance. <coughs> Absolute praise and adoration to you. <coughs> Father, right now we would ask that you would bless our lunchtime together downstairs. Let us be an encouragement to each other. And let us be a blessing to one another. In Jesus' name, amen.